Jim Colby is a former Republican congressman who says Donald Trump has taken the GOP in a poisonous direction. And that's one reason he's voting for Joe Biden. He joins us from Arizona to talk about that. Let's get to the big story first. What do you make of this incredible New York Times story, release of all these tax returns and the fact that he only paid $750 the last two years? Well, I think my first reaction is certainly understand now why he didn't want to release his tax returns and have anybody see them during the campaign or since then. And it's quite ironic that considering that in 2012, he was complaining that Obama paid only 20 and a half percent. He was paying nothing that year. So 10 of the last 15 years, he's paid zero taxes. And then the year he was president, paid $750 on the year. The first year he's elected, he pays $750. I just don't think the American people really can quite understand how, how that can be. Somebody that's got the kinds of revenue and income and end up with paying no taxes at all. Plus, you're robbing from the people when you do that. Yeah. Other people well, have to pay more because you pay less. You know, I have no objection to people using the tax code as it's set out to do. But in this case, he's got a, an audit with a, something against him. This is more than, seven, I think, $79 million that he's potentially liable for. Uh, and, and you just see the lists of some of his deductions, $70,000 for his hairstyling. I mean, those are just business deductions that don't make sense to the American people. All right, we'll focus on your endorsement of Joe Biden in a minute. What are your thoughts on Trump's nomination of uh, Judge Barrett? Well, I think she's a very qualified candidate. I think she'll be probably a very good Supreme Court justice, and one that I would support. It's the way this has taken place, which I think makes it so difficult and is, is the problem. Uh, and it goes all the way back to Bork in 1987, when he was savaged by the Democrats, we've turned it into a verb to bork somebody. And then we that was followed by Clarence Thomas, it was followed by Reed saying he was, was not going to have filibusters for judicial appointments. And then that was followed by the Republicans saying, we're gonna take the filibuster away from the Supreme Court as well. And leading right, and then of course you had the fact that we didn't consider uh, a nominee of, of President Obama in 2016 and now right up to this, where a month before the election, we're considering a nomination. She may be very qualified, but I think it's wrong to do it right now. I think this is just not the right time to do it. The American public should some and they might be able to do that on November 3rd. All right, shifting to the election. Earlier this month, you wrote an op-ed piece for the Arizona Daily Star in which you declared, I remain a conservative, which is why I'm voting for Biden. Explain. Yeah, I, I, in that in that op-ed op piece uh, that I wrote, uh, I gave five basic reasons why I thought uh, we should be supporting Biden and not Trump. And the basic reason, Larry, is that Trump is not a conservative. He's not a Republican. In fact, he's actually been registered as a Democrat, I think, more years than he was ever registered as a Republican. But he's not really a, true to any of the Republican principles. And as I pointed out in that, I, I believe in the kind of the Burkean philosophy going back to Edmund Burke back in the 18th century, who said that conservatism means preserving what is good and what we should have as we go forward and, and, and change it as we move forward. But you don't throw everything away. He doesn't follow any of those principles. Following those kinds of principles, I have things that I suggested are reasons why he's not in a question at all or, or true to the Republican Party principles. First is the fact that uh, he's He's spending he, on spending. Uh, there's no no sense of balancing the budget or trying to re restrain uh, federal spending. Uh, both sides are bad on that, but the Republicans used to uh, stand for fiscal integrity. They don't really do that anymore. I think the second reason that I suggested is that uh, on, on in, in the world, our lack of leadership in the world is really very strong and I, very obvious. And I think we need to continue to play that role. Third, I think we've always been a beacon for democracy and freedom around the world. And we've completely abandoned this. This is a president that is would rather spend his time with the likes of Erdogan, Xi Jinping, uh, and those kinds of people rather than supporting democracies around the world. And then lastly, I suggested that uh, I think his 
behavior towards people who served in the military and the things he said very publicly on the record about John McCain a few years ago, where he said, I don't like people that got captured. I like people who didn't get captured. Uh, and he more recently is noted as having said they call them suckers and losers. He just doesn't understand people that serve as for the purpose of service to our country. And I think that's just plain wrong. Is this the death of your party if Trump loses? Is Trumpism dead? Well, I'm a member of another group called Repair, which is looking toward past the election to how we can reconfigure, how we can change the Republican Party and get it back on track to the basic principles I just discussed a moment ago. And I think that's really one of the key things. No, I don't think it's the death of the party, but I think we're going to have to figure out where we're going from here. You served on a naval destroyer and with a division of swift boats during the Vietnam War. You knew and admired the late Senator John McCain. I knew him very well. Is Trump fit to be a commander in chief? I think he's not fit to be commander in chief. I think he's demonstrated by his the statements he's made about those who serve in the military and about the way he's handled things. I don't think he is fit to be commander in chief. And I think there's a number of people who were in the military that have left and have come out and said just that. Do you wonder what John would be saying? We know what Cindy's saying. Cindy's supporting his, his widow, is supporting uh, Senator Biden. And I think John McCain would clearly be uh, not supporting Trump this time. For sure, he would not be. All right, give us your outlook on Arizona for November 3rd. It's going to be a close election out here. I mean, Arizona is clearly changing. The demographics are changing in the state because of the growing suburban population and the larger Hispanic population. I'm not sure this will be the election where it will finally turn. Arizona has only voted for a Democrat for president once for, uh, 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 for Clinton in 1996 since 1952. That's the last time that Democrats carried this state. Uh, so, but it is changing. It's becoming more of a purple state. I think right now it's close, but I would give the slight edge right now to Biden in this race. Jim, frankly, how did you let you and your others let the party get into the hands of Trump? I think all of us take some responsibility for that. I was in the House of Representatives when we started a process of kind of just trying to tear down the House when Newt Gingrich became Speaker. I mean, we got into the majority because of what he was able to do. But I think we've we've seen society, not just Republicans in the House, become more polarized. The Internet has made people listen to more to, to other sources of, of, of information than that, that are real. They're not real sources of information. It's divided the country. It's polarized the country. And Republicans have just played into that. Now, I would say that I think the Democrats have also moved to the other side, to the left, with the people like uh, Casio cortez uh, and Bernie Sanders. Uh, the, I think Biden will be a centrist, but I think he's going to have to govern in that way if he's going to succeed. Do you think he will win? I think he's going to win, yes. I do think he's, Biden is going to win. Uh, this election. But a lot is going to depend on how the turnout goes. Uh, the polls all show him leading in these states, but it also shows the ones with the most enthusiasm are the Trump voters. So it depends on who actually turns out to vote on Election Day. But I'll tell you, Larry, what concerns me the most is what happens the day after the election and the days following the election. There's every indication that I, I think for sure we're not going to know who's elected on election night, the 3rd of November. And it could go days, weeks before we actually know. And I'm just hopeful that we'll have a smooth transition. But you have a president who said repeatedly that he's not going to guarantee that he will accept the results if he's defeated. Well, you could have a constitutional crisis. You certainly could have a constitutional crisis. There are several, as you know, there are several people who have been writing about this and have suggested that. I saw something the other day about a political science professor who did some war gaming using Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other, and given four scenarios of how the election might turn out. Only one of them resulted in not having violence. 
So I mean, I think we are facing a real, a real danger here. Do you think there's a chance Trump would lose and not want to get out of the office? Well, I think the one thing that we know for sure is that Trump will not concede. He will never concede. Even if he loses, even if he's removed from office, he will never concede. Do you think most of your Republican friends and followers and people you've been with you a long time will stand up to that and order him to leave? Yes, I think they will. I think that would be a line that will be crossed that they will not uh, they will not do themselves. That he may cross it, but they will not do. The, the problem is going to be before that, when he says the election was stolen, these votes should not be counted, these absentee votes should not be counted. You know, we talk about 2020 being the election of the Chad, the hanging Chad in Florida, 20, 2000, I should say. 2020 is going to be the election of the postmark. Well, Ballots should be counted, not what is this postmark valid? I can't read the date on this postmark. Which do we consider this or not? That's going to be what's, what hangs this election up. And he's going to try to stir it up right from the start, don't you think? Uh, he'll try to stir it up on the election night. The, uh, the polls clearly indicate that most Republicans, the larger part of the Republicans, are going to vote on election day whereas a majority of Democrats are going to vote by mail, uh, and I should say Biden supporters versus Trump supporters, Biden supporters are going to vote by mail. So it's very likely that he will be leading early in the evening, and he will claim victory. And I think what he's likely to do is say, that's it, the election's over, we should shut this down, no more counting, no more absentee ballots, that's the end of it there. Whereas the reality is every state with some of these crazy rules they have in the state don't even start opening their absentee ballots until after the election is over. So it is going to be days before those absentee ballots are counted. And we know that we're going to have at least 50% of Americans voting by mail this year. So it's going to be a huge number. Jim, always great seeing you. Stay well. Thanks, Larry. It's great talking with you. Appreciate it very much. Thanks a lot.